Matthew chapter 14, verse 22. And this is what God says, his word says. Immediately Jesus made his disciples get into a boat and go before him to the other side while he sent the multitudes away. And when he had sent the multitudes away, he went up on a mountain by himself to pray. Now when evening came, he was alone there. But the boat was now in the middle of the sea, tossed by the waves, for the wind was contrary. Now in the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went to them walking on the sea. And when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were troubled, saying, It is a ghost. And they cried out for fear. But immediately Jesus spoke to them, saying, Be of good cheer, it is I, do not be afraid. And Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it is you, command me now to come onto the water. And he said, Come. And when Peter had come down out of the boat, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. But when he saw that the wind was boisterous, he was afraid. And beginning to sink, he cried out, saying, Lord, save me. And immediately Jesus stretched out his hand and caught him and said to him, Oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? And when they got in the boat, the wind ceased. Last verse. Then those who were in the boat came and worshiped, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. It is my assignment, very briefly, to preach to you a message this morning called, No Fear. No, 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 not N-O fear, K-N-O-W fear, because you can never have N-O fear without K-N-O-W fear. Lift your hands, Father, I thank you for your words. Speak now in Jesus' name. And everybody who believes, say amen. amen. You can be seated, you can be seated. Touch your neighbor as you're seated. Thank you so much, worship team. Touch your neighbor, say no fear, no fear, no fear, no fear, no fear, no fear. If there's anything that I would, I would need to, uh, to solidify the substratum of this text this morning to validate the point I'm trying to make in your hearing, I would, I would need you to know this, that your life as a believer, your life as a believer can be sectioned into two places. You would have to understand that there is, there is two places you walk in as a believer. Your walk to God and your walk with God. Everybody in this room, no matter who you are, no matter where you came from, no matter what color you are, everybody in this room had to walk to him. Mm. Everybody in this room had to make a decision about Jesus. Are you hearing me in this room? Everybody in this room had to make some type of choice concerning the Christ that stood in front of you and his cross. Everybody had to walk to him. But it is those that accepted what they saw that graduated from just walking to him to now walking with him. Because the truth of the matter about your walk with God and this faith journey is you are not just called to walk to God. Y'all ain't saying nothing. I said you are not just called to walk to God. It is not enough just to be saved. It is not enough just to be saved. It is not enough just to have salvation. It is not enough just to accept the free gift. In fact, when you begin to understand this concept, you will understand that God didn't just save you from your sin. He saved you for your purpose. Oh, it changes everything when you realize that you were not just saved from sin, but you were saved for a purpose. It changes how you worship. It changes how you pray. It changes how you do church. It changes how you serve the house when you realize that I was made for more than just a health protection plan. Every believer has to know you have a walk to God and a walk with God. And in between the walk to and the walk with, there is always a two-word test of discipleship. Follow me. The two-word test of discipleship is not an essay question. It is an obedience question that says, I have saved you. Now, if you really want the extent of what I want to give to you, follow me. Ah. I believe we have grossly misunderstood the power and the easiness of accepting Jesus. And on the inverse, I believe we have grossly misunderstood how hard it is to follow. See how quiet it is already? You should have got your shout out now. It's going to get better. 
Because we have made it really hard for people to accept him and then said, man, that was hard. You know, you had works and stuff. And then we try to make it real easy for people to follow him. But the truth is, it was easier to accept him than it was to follow him. I always wondered how Jesus could roll up on four fishermen in the book of Matthew chapter 4, stand in front of them and say, follow me, and then leave everything, walk away from everybody, and follow. I always wonder how two words could cause men to drop everything until I realized something about following, that people have a propensity to follow what feeds their future. The beauty about following Jesus is that he made you. Y'all ain't saying nothing. I said the beauty about following God is that he made you. God is not guessing about your life. He doesn't have an opinion about your life. God has a destination for your life. And so when he calls you to follow him, he is saying, I'm not here to lead you in the paths of destruction or paths of anger or paths of suffering. I am here to take you to your destiny. And if you're thankful for a God that knows how to lead as you follow, give him some praise right now. He told them, follow me. You are walking in new territory in this second wave of revival. And the only way you will get to where he's called you is if you obey. Follow me. You will not lead this move and get to where you're called to. You will only get to where you're called to if you know how to follow. And Jesus took men who answered and obeyed the two-word test of discipleship. He, obeyed, he said, no, follow me. And this is what they did. They didn't try to walk beside him. They didn't try to get in front of him. They didn't try to move too quickly. All they said is, wherever you walk, I'm going to walk. If you move here, I'm going to move here. I'm going to watch this to bring my life into alignment with yours. You want to know what real discipleship is? Real discipleship is making sure your life sits in alignment with what he says. Because the truth is, as disciple ascends, the highest peak of discipleship is not following Christ, it's imitating the Christ you follow. They walked with him and followed him, and they followed without complaining without grumbling, without somebody saying, I think I ought to be, you know what, I should be doing healings right now. I, I should be the one handling this or that. No, no, no. They just said, wherever you move, I want to move. My question to you is, can you follow until it's your turn? Can you follow long enough? Can you stay in alignment long enough? Some people forfeit the greatness on their life and the anointing you've always wanted because you can't stay behind him long enough until it's your turn. And they walked with him, and as they stood behind him, imitating his every move, all of a sudden they begin to see, this is what happens when you lay your hands on the sick, and this is how it happens when you raise the dead, and this is how you handle Pharisees. And this is how you handle the haters. And this is how you handle the rich folk. And this is how, y'all ain't saying nothing. This is how you deal with this. And this is how you deal with that. But by the time we get to our text, he turns around and says, it's time for you to go to the other side. I'm not going with you. Y'all ain't saying a word to me this morning. I'm not going with you. I'm not even going to tag along behind you. This is your turn because there is a moment when God turns around and says, I trust that everything I've taught you is in you and and it's your turn. Can I tell you what I heard the Lord say about this second wave of revival? There are going to be moments when God turns around and says, 
It's your turn. It's your turn to lay your hands on the sick and see them recover. It's your turn to witness. It's your turn to go into your job. It's your turn to make a difference in your family. It's your turn to sit at Starbucks and let the anointing of God ooze out of your life. It's your turn. Touch your neighbor and say, it's your turn. 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 Oh, I think you didn't hear what I just I said. It's your turn. God is prophetically speaking in this room. You have followed long enough. Year one, he was teaching you about what revival looks like. Year one, he was showing you what a move of God looks like. But in year two, he's stepping to the side and he's saying, it's your turn. Do you realize the entire book of Acts is just Jesus turning around and saying, it's your turn. You, listen, God will grow his church. Jesus will grow the church, but he needs your help. It's your turn. And all of a sudden in our text, this is the first moment where he turns around and says, I'm not going with you. It's your turn. I'm hanging because I got some stuff to do. But everything I've been putting in you, you're going to have to use it. And the text says that now there is a moment, watch this, of separation. Never confuse God's separation as God's severance. Just because he's not there in body doesn't mean he's not with you in spirit. Because the, is this too heavy for a Sunday morning? Because the text said that he sent them and then he went to pray. You can always trust that if God sends you without going, that he's still praying. The greatest ministry of Jesus in these last days is the intercessory work for his church. It is the thing that he's still doing right now for you. In fact, there are some people in this room that the next time you praise God, you ought to praise him for the prayer life of Jesus. You ought to praise him that he ever sits by the throne making intercession for you. The prayer life of Jesus is what didn't let the accident kill you. The prayer life of Jesus is what the what lets the anointing flow on you. It's the prayer life of Jesus that didn't let that family member die. It was his prayer life for you. If you're thankful for his prayer life, make some noise for Jesus right now. See, that, that, that means this. If you don't have family praying for you, and you ain't got nobody praying for you that's in your circle of friends, that doesn't mean that you don't have anybody praying for you at all. Because if they don't pray for you, it really don't matter as long as he is praying for me. He says, I'm sending you and I'm praying for you. I could drop this microphone and walk out the door and we could have had church right there on that. Because if he's praying for you, what are you afraid of? If he's praying for you, what are you worried about? If he's praying for you, what are you so timid about? If he's praying for you, why are you not having more boldness? Why are you, why are you sitting in timidity? If he's praying for you, you ought to stomp out even if you've got a water pistol and say, I'm taking on the gates of hell because he's praying for me. Do you not know the promise that if God be for you, who can be against you? If God be for you, no demon in hell stands a chance. Touch your neighbor say, he's praying for me right now. Yeah, 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 he's praying for me right now. Watch this, and I gotta hurry. Watch this, in the text, they are moving and he's praying. Look at the connection. They're moving. He's praying. As long as you stay moving, he's going to stay praying. The trouble where we see no release from God is when we stop moving and expect God to do what he said he would do. The text says then, that all of a sudden he's praying. Why is he praying? Because this is what Jesus knew about destiny and about life. He knew this, storms come. I wish I had some real people. 
broke or rich, storms come. White or black, storms come. Hispanic or Asian, storms come. Whether you had a daddy or you didn't have one, storms come. Whether your family is perfect or your family puts the funk in dysfunctional, storms come. No matter where you are in life, no matter how old, whether you are old and whether you are young, storms come. There is one guarantee about the life you live, storms come. Stop treating it, stop treating it as if if you should need a pity party for going through a storm. If you are going to do anything great in the kingdom of God, you must walk into your greatness knowing that storms come. Do you realize the storm is a compliment? Y'all ain't saying a word. I said storms are compliments. It means you are heading in the right direction. If you get hit with a storm, that means you are pushing back hell's territory. If you ever get hit with a storm, it's because you're moving in the right direction. It means hell doesn't want you to head that way. But if I know some people that know the peace speaker of every storm, if you've got Jesus with you, make some noise for Jesus right now. Storms come. Stop being the victim. Well, my finances are worse. My family's worse. You are forfeiting victory when you assume the role of the victim. And storms come. And as he sends them into a new level, they get hit with a storm. Which brings to light fear number one in the passage. They are afraid, the text says, of the storm. Can I go one step further with this? I want you to understand that this storm did not hit them on the shore. The text says it was not until they got to the midst of the sea that they got hit. What is that telling me? That's telling me that when they got into the deep places, because middle just doesn't mean midpoint. It means to the greatest depth. As you get into the deeper things of God and the greater depths of God, that's when real storms hit because hurricanes don't do too well on land. You always know you are going to greater depths by the size of the storm that hits you. Some of us are content with, with, with winning over thunderstorms in our walk with God. Well, I've made it through the rain. Meanwhile, there's somebody out there shaking for revival in the midst of a hurricane, saying, I ain't ain't content with standing on the shore. I don't want shore destiny. I want deep destiny. My destiny doesn't live in shallow places. My destiny lives in deep places. And all of a sudden, they are in a deep place hit by a great storm. He's praying, they're moving, and fear number one hits them because when they got to the midst, watch this, they could look in front of them and not see land. And yet when they looked behind them, they could not see land. Have you ever been in a place that when you looked forward to your future, you couldn't see it, but you were too far disconnected from it? from your past to go back. Let me tell you, that's a scary place to be sometimes when you don't know what God's about to do, but you're too far disconnected to go back now. They are there. The storm hits because the enemy knows when to attack. I don't have time. He knows when to hit you. And now they are sitting in a place where they are heading towards destiny. They have left history. And now they are, watch this, afraid. They are fearful of the circumstance, afraid of the storm. But can I tell you today, you ought never be afraid of a storm. Because anything he put you in to get to the other side has been built to float to the other side. 
Y'all miss what I just told you. I said whatever vessel he puts you in has been designed and destined to make it to the other side. God doesn't send you to destroy you. He sends you to release what's in you. You have to know the boat is built to last. Touch your neighbor say the boat's going to make it. The boat's going to make it. The boat's going to make it. Oh, if you heard what I just told you, I said the boat, everything he promised you is yes and amen. If God sent you to the other side, you're going to make it. If God I promise you a great outpouring. The boat is built to make it. God will not send you in a leaky boat. Well, then how do boats sink? They only sink then when what's on the outside makes its way to the inside. The only time your life will ever sink and the only time you will ever not make it is not because God didn't destine you to make it, but simply because you allowed your externals to invade your internals. People that make it through the storm, people that ride on top of the winds and waves are people who walk through it without it getting in them. You've got to have the kind of faith to walk through it without it getting in you. You should never be afraid of a storm as long as the storm stays out there. And I remain in here. Now I know the question, how do I know, how do I know if it's getting in? Good question. I'm glad you asked. You will know what's in the boat by your conversation. (laughs) You will know what you're full of by what you talk about. Because out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. See, if you really want to know what you're living with, no, no, not that fake churchy stuff, that hallelujah, bless God. Go home today on your ride back from church, and whatever's coming out of your mouth is what's in your heart. Whatever you're talking about on Tuesday and Wednesday, that's what's living in your heart. See, some of us in this room know how to camouflage the leak in our boats. We know how to bless God, praise the Lord, hallelujah, on Sunday morning. But our real conversation at home is stuff like how the bill's going to get paid. You are sure a terrible husband. You are sure a terrible wife. My kids are bad. My job stinks. I hate my boss. And we wonder why we sink in the middle of a storm. Our mouth is telling on us that our heart is not full of the right thing. Am I helping anybody this morning? If every t- if there's ever been a time you went down, you only went down because of what you let in. Well, flip it. Inversely, this will always tell me who's really full of the Holy Ghost. Because any person that speaks in tongues has told me that they are full of the Holy Ghost. See, when you get full of the Spirit of God, the Spirit of God will talk through you. He'll use your mouth to show you what you're full of. When you see a preacher talking in tongues, that's a good sign you're in a good house. For, for, forget all these cessationist people that say that the Holy Ghost, they re- listen, I don't want to be in a house where the man of God and the woman of God and the staff of God isn't full of the Holy Ghost. I don't want to be in a church where the members are afraid of the Holy Ghost. I want to know that the Spirit of God is here. But let me tell you how I know the Spirit is here is when you that thing comes up out of your spirit. It tells me he is here. Some of you are waiting until you feel God. And some of you heard him long before you felt him. Let me tell you, God can be heard more easily than he can be felt. Are you hearing me? 
and fear number one comes in because now, watch this, they are rising, but they should never be afraid, which leads me to one step deeper with the boat. Watch this. How then do I keep it out? How do I keep it out? You have to understand, in order for them to keep what was on the outside from getting in the inside, they would pitch the boat. They would tar the boat. They would cover the boat. Y'all ain't saying nothing. They would seal the boat. That means some external force had to be applied to the outside of the boat. What am I telling you? I'm telling you that the blood of Jesus still works. Because if you want to know what gets applied to your life to keep every devil away, to keep every demon out of your house, to keep all those things like worry, doubt, and fear out, you got to know that when Jesus died for you, you can put the blood on your life. And when you put the blood on your life, everything that would come to harm you has to back up off you because the blood still works. If you're thankful for the blood of Jesus that keeps worry and doubt and fear away, I dare you to give him praise right now for the blood. Oh, the blood, 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 the blood that keeps disease away, the blood that keeps emotions that are not of God away, the blood still works. Your boat has been sealed by the blood of Jesus. The blood still works. If you work it. That's why I gave you a chance to shout. Because even though the boat won't let it in, you can still give an invitation to somebody else. That's why when the enemy really wants to mess up your boat, he knows he cannot penetrate the blood. But if he can get you to open up the door. So what I do if I'm the devil is I don't bring a disease at that point. I don't bring anything uh, that is external to it. I bring a relationship. Because if I can get you to connect with people who know how to puncture holes in your faith, I can get, am I helping anybody? I can get you to destroy your destiny all by yourself. You know who they are in your life by how you feel when you leave them. You know the people you get on the phone with, you came out of revival. got on the phone after revival and all of a sudden somebody gets on the phone and you talking about what God's about to do I got my assignment I know my submission I'm gonna be and they still talk about giving all that time you get around those people well you know are you really ready do you really think you can are you really that gifted are you really and all of a sudden by the time you started the phone call you were full of faith And by the time the conversation's over, you are drowning in fear because you have allowed. That's why, let me just put it like this. You better watch who you connect with. In this move of God, you ought to go after the lost, but you better be watching who gets in your boat with you. You better watch who's puncturing holes in your faith. In fact, you better go ahead and make up your mind. If you are not here to build me up, if you're not here to push me to another level, if you are not here to shove me into my destiny, then I can't hang with you no more. You're going to have to find another boat to get in. you have to find somebody else's life because I'm going to where he called me. If you believe in me, God, give God some praise right now. And they are afraid. I could, I could go all day. I could go all day. They are afraid of the circumstance. In the middle of a move of God, that's the first fear that always comes. Will my city be okay with this? Will my ex turtles be okay? And we're going to get stopped by the mayor. Principalities, powers, and high places. We're going to get stopped externally. Watch this. Right when it seemed like everything on the outside was getting ready to take over everything on the inside, look who comes. Right when it looked like, y'all ain't saying nothing. 
right when it looked like they were about to let this thing fall apart and everything God said was going to go down in flames and the enemy was going to win, guess who jumps up from praying? The text said, all of a sudden, he stopped praying and said, it's praying is over. I got to get down in this thing. I got to start acting. And so here comes Jesus. Touch your neighbor and say, here comes Jesus. When it gets real bad, you ain't going to have to fight for yourself. When it gets real bad, you ain't going to have to worry about the victory. Because if God be for you, no man can be against you. And if God has sent you, God said, this is my fight. If they go pick a battle with you... They better know I'm coming to take up for my kids. Give God some praise for his protection. Oh, I said, here comes Jesus. Here comes Jesus. No matter how bad the storm is, here comes Jesus. No matter the winds or the waves, here comes Jesus. Watch this. Here he comes. And he's walking on. What everybody else is sinking in. Do you really know the God you serve? They're sinking. The boat's going under. And he's going, look at what I still have authority over. Let me put it in your world. I got a doctor's report that says I got cancer. I got a doctor's report that says I got a heart issue. I got something going on in my family. They said my husband's leaving. He came in and told me. Let me tell you, when Jesus walks in, he will never walk in to validate your problem. He will walk on top of your problem to say you can still have victory. What am I telling you? That when Jesus shows up, it's not about the fact of what's happening. It's about the truth of who he is. You got cancer, but I'm a healer. Oh, you got a family problem, but I'm a redeemer. I walk on what everybody else sinks in because all authority is in my hands. You ought to give God a praise right now. You ought to give him some praise right now. That thing that came against you will not succeed. That weapon formed will not prosper because he walks on what you're in. Here he comes. He's walking. He's walking on it. He's walking on it. He's walking on it. I want to tell somebody he's walking on it right now. He's walking on it right now. You ain't got to fear, worry, or doubt. He's walking right now. And here's my issue with the text. I preached all that to get to here. Because I thought there was only one fear in the text. The fear of the circumstance. Until the text says, as he comes... They see him coming and say, it is a ghost. Because God is hard to recognize in a storm. Sometimes when he comes, he doesn't come in a way that you've always seen. Sometimes when he shows up, it's not like how you wanted it and how you thought it ought to be. Sometimes he comes in a way you have never seen him come, but nevertheless, it is him. When I read this, my spirit man jumped because I realized there's a secondary fear. Because now not only are they afraid of the problem, but they are afraid of the solution. Oh, now I am afraid of the circumstance and the solution all at the same time. Let me, let me put it in your world. You are on a plane. The plane starts to crash. All of a sudden, you know this plane is going down. That's the problem. The plane's going down. Meanwhile, somebody looks at you and says, hey, here's a parachute. Jump. (laughs) There it is. There it hits you. The problem is the plane going down. Fear of the plane going down. My second issue is now I'm afraid that I have to jump with this parachute. 
and there are people in this room going, Lord, is there another option? But you know that you got to have a sound mind and good discernment because if you stay long enough on this plane, y'all ain't saying nothing. If you stay long enough on that plane, that plane will take you down. It will destroy you. Sometimes you got to make up your mind. Am I going to sit here and be afraid of the problem my entire life or will I take on the, oh, the solution and say it doesn't feel right? It makes me afraid, but I understand that if it's you, I've got to jump out to where you are or die here on this boat. God told me that this is where some of you are living right now because when he showed up watch this albeit a ghost he was trying to tell them your opportunity out has come here's the choice you have to make Do I stay in mediocrity? Or do I step out into my opportunity? And most people, when faced with this decision, do the same thing. Nothing. Sitting and rocking in a boat of mediocrity. Tormented, y'all ain't saying a word. Frustrated, upset, angry, bitter. Oh God, all these emotions swirling over top of you, swaying in a sea of mediocrity. And if you sit there too long, you'll become so bitter that all you do is criticize what you could be walking in. Complaining about what you could have had years ago, but because you didn't know fear. Not knowing that the longer you sit in mediocrity, you are playing right into the plan of the enemy for your life. Because one of the most subtle seductions of the enemy is to lure you into mediocrity. Watch this, and to steal your life. There are people in this room, you've already given away your 20s and your 30s. You've given away your 40s and now you're in your 50s. And God is trying to tell you through a preacher from Florida, it's time to get out of the boat. God has sent a preacher to tell you, you have stayed here too long. God has sent this preacher from Florida to tell you, there is more for you than where you're living. If you think that all you were called to was a boat in the middle of a storm, if you think that all you were ever called to was mediocrity and average living, God says, I did not give my life. I did not shed my blood. I did not come to give you abundant life for you to stay here in mediocrity. And when I think about all that Jesus has done for me, it makes me want to say, get out the boat. Oh, I don't think you heard me. When I think about Jesus and everything he's done in my life, it makes me want to tell you, get out of that boat. Get out of that boat. It's time to move forward, even if it's with a little bit of fear. Somebody can come to the keys. I'm finishing right here. Be seated. Be seated. Let me finish. Let me finish. And most people never make it Uh, until one, watch this, you give me five minutes, one out of 12. When I read that, that startled me. No, no, that's less than 10%. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. 11, 12. Out of this whole section, she's the only one that would have gotten out. You hear that? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. One of them would have walked in their destiny. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. One of them would have stepped into their purpose. Y'all ain't saying nothing. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. One of y'all. The 11 that stayed, missed out on a moment. But Peter says, I may be with him, but 
I am not like them. See, I feel like there are some people in this room today that say I may be with them, but my faith is not like them. I am not one of the 11. I am the one out of the 12 that believes God has something greater for me than this storm that I'm in. And Peter says, bid me, bid me. If you just say the word, I'm coming out. What Peter is saying is, I want to know you, hallelujah, in a dimension I have never known you before. I want to know you on a level. I wonder if I'm in a room this morning with some people that say, God, I want to know you on a level I have never known you before. And I don't care if the 11 stay seated. I don't care if the 11 tell me not to do it. I don't care if they stay in mediocrity. As for me in my house. As for me in my house, if you tell me I'm coming, I'm coming. And he said, come.